Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti. Solo qualche brevissima parola di introduzione perché nel sistema dell'Istituto Universitario Europeo il segretario generale dice solo cose graziose, non esprime opinioni. So I would like to thank very much the uh, Robert Schumann Center and uh, the Foreign School of Banking and Finance that are an essential part of the European University Institute activities and Casa di Risparmio di Firenze for uh, organizing this very interesting uh, um, seminar. We are very glad to have here Governor Patrick Honohan discussing a very, very interesting topic, the central bank in Europe today, over mighty or underpowered. So I think uh, the director of the Robert Schumann Center will give uh, an introduction, so I don't dare to make any comments, but I think this, the subject is very, very important. Many observers uh, still maintain that in 2011 our single currency was saved by the European Central Bank, but on the same, uh, on the same topic they say that this means that we have no democracy because political decision makers are not able to deal with the single currency, so it's the European Central Bank that have to make uh, the hard uh, decision. But uh, nowadays we also have an important debate going on about the powers of the European Central Bank concerning the regulation on the non-performing loans that is the object of different legal opinions within European institutions. So thank you very much for, uh, for being here and I'm sure you will not regret to spend a sunny afternoon here in Villa La Fonte to listen to uh, Governor Honan uh, address. Thank you very much. I take So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll begin by introducing myself. I'm Bridget Laff, and I'm director of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies here at the European University Institute. And today we are guests of one of the mo one of our newest programs at the Schumann Center, and that is the Florence School of Banking and Finance. It was launched just in January 2016, so it's not even uh, two years old yet. Uh, and it, this op I now have an opportunity to publicly express our deep appreciation and gratitude to the uh, Fondazione Sierra Firenze, without whom we simply could not have done this. They gave us the essential support to allow us launch uh, what is in effect a startup. Uh, the school, Florence School of Banking and Finance. And what lay behind the school was, uh, the, in response to the Eurozone crisis, the decision to centralize the supervision of banking in Europe. And because the European University Institute has a European mission and a European responsibility, and also the Schumann Center, uh, our part of our remit is to engage with the world of practice, to engage with new developments of significance in Europe, in the European Union. And the centralization of supervision was a centralizing, in, in many ways could be described as a federalizing, uh, albeit sectoral federalization, and extremely important. And in response to that, we thought that this institution had to respond uh, by establishing the uh, Florence School of Banking and Finance. And so far, this does, the school does two things. It engages in policy debate on the major issues confronting this new and developing system, uh, and it engages in executive training, training those who are now tasked with implementing uh, the new system. And so we, on both these areas, we have policy debates, an annual conference, executive seminars, online seminars, webinars, and I invite you all to engage with us on a continuous basis. You will find uh, all of the activities on our website. And then on the executive training side, uh, we have trained a very impressive number of people in the, bank, in the world of banking and finance in such a short time. 
and the model tends to be either residential trainings here in Florence, a number take place elsewhere, although not many, online training and in-house training for the European institutions. This is clearly an evolving system and therefore the uh, Florence School of Banking and Finance will continue to evolve, change, new offers, uh, engage perhaps more with the private sector in the years ahead. And we're now planning our next year, our next three year program for the school. So we're at a very important juncture and we're uh, delighted that the Fondazione will continue uh, to support our, uh, will continue to support our efforts. I would also publicly as director of Schumann like to thank uh, the very small team that we have here at the Robert Schumann Center who run this startup. Uh, the uh, head of training, Fabio Canova, has done a wonderful job in from virtually nothing getting uh, a curriculum up and running across uh, a very uh, diverse range of areas. Pierre, Jan, uh, Donato, Francesca, it's really a small cohesive team that has done a wonderful job of getting our, uh, our plant, we've now planted the seeds and now we have to nurture it uh, to, the next, uh, to the next level and I look forward very much to working with everyone uh, on this. It's also a very uh, deep personal pressure for, pleasure for me to welcome Patrick Honahan here uh, today. Uh, those of you who would recognize an Irish accent uh, would know that uh, by now that I'm also Irish. So Patrick and I share, <laughs> uh, we are both Irish and um, Patrick Honan has engaged in something that I suspect few central bankers ever have to do. In September 2009, in the midst of what was an extraordinary and deep crisis of the Irish banking and financial system, he was handed the most poison chalice of any uh, governor of any central bank in Europe at the time. And he simply did an extraordinary job. Uh, this was uh, in... Uh, September 2008, the Irish state, in its wisdom at the time, the Irish government, uh, made a pledge to guarantee all of the liabilities of the Irish banking system without even knowing what those liabilities were. And it really could have taken the country down. It was that serious. Uh, and when the history of this period is written, Patrick Honehan will be one of a very small group of people who effectively ensured that there wasn't political, economic and societal uh, collapse in Ireland. And I would put it that strongly because the crisis was that serious. Uh, but I knew Patrick long before then. Uh, he was a professor at uh, Trinity College Dublin. He also taught at my home university in Ireland, University College Dublin. Uh, he is a graduate of U University College Dublin and his PhD comes from uh, the LSE. He also worked uh, for many, many years uh, in the World Bank and in Ireland's uh, leading uh, economic research, the ESRI. So for all of those reasons, I can't imagine anyone better placed to talk to us uh, about central banking in Europe today. He was governor of the Irish Central Bank and a member of the board of the governing council of the European Central Bank at an extraordinary time. And uh, all central banks across the world had to react to the Great Recession, and some did with more speed than others, but all engaged in non-standard measures. In a sense, given the nature of the crisis, uh, they had to look to non-standard measures, things that central banks probably would prefer not to have to do if they could avoid it. Uh, and I have no doubt that the European Central Bank, and with its president, or um, Mari Draghi, was the essential uh, voice that in the end took the heat out of the acute phase of the Eurozone crisis. Without the central bank, and those of us who write on the European Union will always compare the refugee crisis to the Eurozone crisis, and in one there was an institution with power and authority, and in the other there wasn't. And that, I think, is the difference between these two crises and the capacity of the, uh, of the uh, European Union 
uh, and Eurozone to respond. But more than anything else for me, uh, Patrick is one of the great heroes of probably uh, the most uh, difficult period in Irish history for a, very, uh, for a very long time. And so for that reason, uh, I'm delighted he's here today. But before we begin the talk, I want to hand over to Andrea Simoncini, who will welcome us on behalf of the Fondazione. You're very welcome. So thank you, Bridget. And uh, I am Andrea Simoncini. I'm a, I'm a professor of law at the University of Florence and also a former student here at the Institute. But this evening, I'm here on behalf of the foundation Casa di Risparmio di Firenze, um, and especially on behalf of Gabriele Gori and Umberto Tombari, the general director and the president of the foundation uh, that co-sponsors this, this lecture this evening. Um, unfortunately, they have other uh, commitments, and, but they asked me to express uh, all the appreciation and support of the Foundation uh, to this initiative. And so uh, I'd like, uh, on behalf of the Foundation, uh, to join the Institute in uh, welcoming and thanking again Professor Onohan for his participation uh, to this lecture, but more generally for his contribution to the board, of scientific board of the school. Yes. Uh, uh, well, the, the foundation, the, the foundation Casa de Risparmio uh, has been um, a strong, I would say, and also convinced and committed uh, ally and partner of the School of Bank and Finance since its very beginning. Um, as Brigitte, uh, she was saying uh, just a minute ago, uh, next year will be the third year of our uh, cooperation between the, uh, the school and, 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 um, and the foundation. And uh, the, the responsible of the foundation and of the institute, they have uh, just met some days ago and they decided uh, to continue this cooperation and possibly also to enlarge the scope and uh, um, areas in which this cooperation could, um, could reach. So, um, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I think that this conference is exactly the demonstration of the, of the reason of this partnership. Uh, that is the possibility of having here in Florence, of building here um, a, a, an important, a relevant institution, a school, as the Florence School of Bank and Finance, where uh, you can have uh, a unique uh, opportunity of dialoguing, of studying, of researching, on the themes of bank and finance, having here, attracting here the key actors, the protagonists of, of, this, um, of this debate, of these policies. And uh, Professor and Governor Ornahan is exactly one of uh, the most interesting and prestigious uh, examples of those actors in this, in this debate. Uh, so um, um, I simply say again that I'm happy to be here and to have the possibility of listening to the lecture of uh, Professor Onahan, and I'm again grateful for, to, the, to the school and to the institute for having organized this opportunity. So thank you again. Thank you. We can give the floor to yes. Professor Onahan. Well, thank you very much for those uh, very kind and exaggerated uh, um, introductions. Uh, a few people are sitting at the back, but please, there are four seats in the very front row here, and there are some at the side, so please don't feel that you have to stand at the back. Um, so here's my title, a bit provocative, Central Banking in Europe Today, Overmighty or Underpowered. The, the ECB was was set up, you know, at a time when it was fashionable to move to a kind of technocratic central bank. Central banks narrowly focused on the goal of price stability. And that goal was seen as requiring only the use of a very limited set of tools, small toolbox. It's a goal that required removing the monetary authority from short-termist pressures of the electoral cycle, the political pressures, but it only required, as it appeared, a very small toolbox. And this model seemed to be pretty successful during the 1990s. 
It was an era that came to be known as the Great Moderation, and that justified the adoption of this model in the European Union. So the ECB, the ECB's monetary policy from the outset, what, what did they do? Well, essentially, they, they made short-term, secured loans to banks at interest rates that were chosen to steer aggregate demand and hence inflation to meet the inflation target of below but close to 2% in the medium term. And for eight years, it went close to achieving that target for the euro area as a whole, and that was part of the story. It's going to be the euro area as a single entity, and we're going to work to model our uh, policy on inflation around that single area. But the crisis made it evident that the instrument toolkit would need to be much broader, and the level of intrusion into markets would need to be much broader if the economic and financial collapse was to be countered. So the crisis changed everything, and not just for the ECB, but for all the major central banks around the world. Now, if we had a long time, I would widen the discussion to take in a number of other important central banks in, the, in Europe, uh, the Bank of England, the Swiss National Bank, the Riks Bank, the Denmark's National Bank. There, there are many interesting stories. But today, with the audience and here in Florence, I want to concentrate on, on the ECB, uh, given the time available. Uh, we can talk maybe in questions and answers if necessary. But the ECB, in a, in a sense, provides the most interesting example of a central bank that has had to widen its horizons, has had to think of its mandate, formerly mainly mind, price stability, but to think of that mandate in a much wider area, and that that presents risks, political risks and operational risks for the, all those central banks. Because they're trying to deliver a much, on a much wider mandate than simply price stability, the ECB and other European central banks have never looked so powerful. Too close. Too close. Oh, to more closer. Okay. So. So if I kind of slump down, it's because I, I'm meant to be closer to the microphone. So they've driven interest rates below zero, and they've purchased trillions of euros. Actually, it's about two and a quarter trillion euro uh, for the ECB alone of government and other bonds. They've become more active in bank supervision. So in the eurozone, as you well know, bank supervision is now centralized in the single supervisory mechanism. That's part of the story that uh, I won't talk much about in, in, in my uh, prepared uh, remarks, but if we want to take it up in questions and answers, I'm more than happy to do that. Some of the central banks in Europe and some of the national central banks within the euro area have introduced macroprudential tools restricting, for example, the scope of loan contracts, such as having upper limits on loan-to-value ratios for loan-to-income ratios for, for uh, household borrowers. So, so it's a much broader toolkit than was used in past decades, and it's being used energetically. So that sounds fine. The ECB was going along smoothly, and it reacted sensibly and aggressively to the crisis. But there are some puzzles. First of all, why were these tools not employed earlier in the crisis? Because I've just made it sound as if as soon as the crisis was there, the ECB jumped up and did all of these things, but it didn't. It took some time before they were all implemented, and where we are now is only somewhere that we got to around 2015. Second question. Well, it's still supposed to get the inflation at close to 2%. Why is inflation in the euro area? That's the main statutory objective of the ECB. Why is that still below target? And the third question then is, is the ECB at the limit? Are there more things that could be done? And if not, are there some special reasons relating to the euro area and the multi-country nature of the euro structure that inhibit that? And finally, in light of that, I want to ask the question, is there a serious risk of a political backlash uh, 
against the central bank that's doing a lot more than people expected it to be doing when it was set up. So, there's a picture of the interest rates. If you doubt that interest rates have changed, they used to be rolling between 2% and 5.5% for the first uh, decade, almost decade of the ECB, and then they were brought right down and bounced around not far above zero for a while, and now firmly below zero, and those are the overnight interbank rates, the so-called Aonia rate uh, for that banks lend to each other, but they lend to each other at rates that are strongly influenced by what the ECB is doing. There's a, a chart that shows you the scale of the ECB's purchase program the, the, as it grows month by month. Uh, that's the up-to-date one. I think it shows it at the end of October. It'll be 60 billion, 60 billion euros higher at the end of November, which is in this week. Uh, and it's broken down between the public sector purchase program, government bonds, that's the big blue or purple section, and then there are a number of other uh, bonds that are issued by non-governments which are being bought by the ECB. This is, these are huge amounts, two, uh, two and a quarter trillion. I think that amounts to something like 5,000 euros for, for every uh, person in the euro area. Well, so I want to talk now first of all about mandates and the explicit and implicit mandate of a central bank like the ECB. You know, if you think back over the three centuries or so of central banking, the range of tasks expected of central banks has rarely been limited to monetary policy. They have a legal mandate, it's written down, but then there's also an implicit, understood mandate. The breadth of their legal mandate, or their mandate defined in legislation, has varied over the years. Price stability has always been central. But while price stability is normally given priority in the mandate, it's usually explicitly accompanied by other elements, such as high employment. So the central bank should maintain price stability and high employment. The United States has that. Or, more vaguely, support for general economic, for wider economic policies. So Britain, the United Kingdom has that, Switzerland, Euro area also has that. The so central banks have also been expected, either explicitly or implicitly, to guard against systemic financial crises and to manage them if and when they occur. We should also remember that in the, for example, in the post-war, post-World War II period, many central banks were operated as arms of government policy, so they contributed quite directly to supporting activities of, of governments. After the collapse of the Bretton Woods system oh, almost half a century ago, followed by two oil price spikes, the problem of inflation came center stage. So although everybody knew that central banks were doing other things, suddenly inflation was more and more important. They began to narrow their focus to the task of regaining control over price stability. High interest rates in the face of persistent labor market and fiscal pressures eventually helped to tame inflation, often at a cost in terms of recession and unemployment. So by the 1990s, Central banks seem to have identified a limited toolkit, limited operating procedures, which, when combined with a clear rules-based mandate, often defined by a numerical target for inflation, and with independence from government direction, enabled them to achieve and maintain price stability. They were concentrating on steering short-term market interest rates to influence aggregate demand while preserving stable inflation expectations. It became accepted that ensuring price level stability requires predictability and steadiness within a well-communicated medium-term framework. And macroeconomic theory began to suggest that there was little else that monetary policy could do to promote, for example, growth, 
our stability in economic activity. So now the uh, central banks from being a jack of all trades looked like a well-honed, targeted policy tool focused on price inflation because they could achieve that and because there was nothing else they could be expected to contribute to uh, in any effective way. Now, with the focus firmly on attainable and measurable target of inflation, st uh, uh, low inflation price stability, for which central banks could be held responsible, you can read the inflation rate every month, say, what are you doing? You're not achieving your target. Society was willing to grant increasingly technocratic central banks the necessary independence to get the job done. He said, okay, we don't need to tell you what to do on a week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year basis. We know what you can do and what you, we can hold you accountable for doing, which is maintaining price stability. And so we're going to set you free to do that, and we won't, as governments, interfere with how you do it. So given that technocratic environment, it was less surprising than it would previously have been to see the European Union create a multi-country central bank representing perhaps the largest international pooling of sovereignty ever known. It's got strict rules about security of tenure and length of appointment of the members of the governing council. And the tasks of central banking were consigned to an unelected body. So at first, as I mentioned, the experiment worked as expected. Inflation in the euro area and in other countries where independent inflation-focused central banking had been adopted, inflation rates were low and stable in the early years of the new millennium. But with the outbreak of the global financial crisis from 2007, the ECB was not the only central bank to wake up to the fact that its implicit mandate was very much wider in a crisis than its explicit one. Central bank behavior in the crisis has differed substantially from the tightly defined and largely rules-based approach which had become standard for monetary policy. The emergence of a macro-financial crisis, it still required clear and credible communication, but it's seen central banks having to move quickly to interpret fast-changing market conditions, and it's required flexibility and decisive action and some surprises. You know, for the 1990s, don't surprise. We don't want any surprises. We want to tell you where we're going. Inflation, stability, interest rates. But there have been surprises, and the central banks have tried to surprise the markets when the markets were not working in a direction that was conducive to stability. Central banks have be employed, in other words, a wider range of tools and have been less predictable in their actions. During the international financial crisis, central banks have used innovative financial engineering and an expansive approach to the provision of liquidity to quell the spread of uncertainty and panic in global financial markets. And they've also been interacting with government more intimately than had been normal than, and expected. So this changed behavior, what does it reflect? It reflects central banks' interpretation of what is often a vague and implicit mandate for financial st system stability. So how do they know what their implicit mandate is? Well, I think what they're doing is they're interpreting this implicit mandate by drawing on an understanding of historic practice of central banks in comparable circumstances, as interpreted by scholars, and as distilled in the dialogue between central bankers from different countries in what can be thought of as a kind of transnational epistemic community of central bankers. For example, through their regular meetings at the BIS, Bank for International Settlements, in Basel and, and at other meetings. So this growing consensus among central bankers on what they should be doing what has worked in previous crises and what was considered normal behavior for central banks has made conventional an array of crisis management policy actions which are at the disposal, as they see it, of central banks. But the use of this wider set of tools also raises questions of democratic legitimacy. Central banks may know what the situation requires, but do politicians accept <laughs> 
that they have delegated such powers to unelected entities, which have much more independence than their predecessors, earlier central banks. And even crisis, central bank independence remains vital, but central banks have recognized that in this crisis, close in consultation and collaboration with government, as well as stronger efforts to ensure accountability with parliaments and with the general public, become necessary both to ensure effectiveness and to retain political and democratic legitimacy for the larger policy steps that need to be taken. Nowhere is this need to ensure democratic legitimacy more pressing than in the Euro area because of the implicit cross-border lending and borrowing involved. So here's a, whoops, I thought I was going to show another slide, it'll come later. That slide I was going to show you now will come later. Because now I want to move on to another question. Why was the ECB so slow compared to other central banks in the crisis to use this wider toolbox? I've been emphasizing how much the ECB has participated in the widening of the toolbox and the aggressively expansionary stance that it has adopted. But looking back to the beginning of the crisis, looking back to 2007, 8, 9, 10, it tells a somewhat different story. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Although the ECB began promptly by flooding the market with liquidity in August 2007, an action which was the first clear acknowledgement of, of, by public authorities worldwide of the gravity of the unfolding crisis, the ECB was demonstrably slower in lowering interest rates and in entering into large-scale asset purchases than were the other central banks. So there's the slide that, that um, uh, gives you the most, most clear indication of that. You see the interest rates in 2007 over at the left-hand side of the slide. Um, maybe this goes like that. No, no I can't see it. Um, and you see they were high in the green US Federal Reserve and the red Euro system. And then already in, 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 in 2007, you see the Federal Reserve is starting to lower interest rates and then it lowers them uh, e e even more aggressively right through 2008. And it's, it's months and months ahead of the ECB. In fact, on interest rates, the ECB actually increased its policy rate on July the 3rd, 2008, and we're already almost a year into a very visible, people might say longer into the crisis than a year, but almost a year into the very visible part of the crisis. And you can see that bump up in the red uh, line, uh, in, in, it's actually on July the 3rd, 2008. Why did they do that? Well, actually, they reflected, it reflected concerns about the inflationary impact of the 50% surge in oil prices that had occurred in the first half of that year. It was actually, the, the increase in oil prices was reversed in the, in the second, more than fully reversed in the second half of the year. The ECB reversed itself again in October. Uh, part of the coordinated interest rate re reduction in, in October 2008, and it continued to reduce rates during the following six months, but it only went, got down to that 1%, which was the floor for a long time, in May 2009, and that was some months after the Federal Reserve, after the Bank of England, after the Swiss National Bank, and the, the Bank of Japan had pushed their rates to what they considered their effective lower bounds. So ECB was very slow to lower interest rates. And actually, and it's a little bit of a, a digression out of sequence, but um, we, can, we could also look at the uh, two-step interest rate increase decided upon by the ECB in early 2011. Do you see the little, little um, ziggurat uh, there uh, towards the middle of the, of the chart? That's a very unusual against a background where uh, four, the four other major central banks uh, certainly the Federal Reserve that you can see and the other three that you, that you can't see there, were maintaining interest rate at their floor levels. Though some other central banks were increasing interest rates in 2011 because they were coming out of, uh, they were coming into recovery. And this 2011 interest rate increase was uh, when, uh, also an occasion when oil prices had surged again, as in 2008, and to almost the same levels. At the time of those interest rate increases in 2011, 
inflation in the euro area was projected to exceed 3%. So not 2%, but 3% uh, by the end of that year. And it did. It did actually increase. But fears that it would have a knock-on or secondary effect leading to persistently higher inflation were proved to be utterly false. So uh, enough about interest rates for a moment. As far as asset purchases were concerned, quantitative easing if you like, the Fed was first out of the blocks, November 2008. Other major central banks, including the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the Riksbank, Swedish Riksbank, and in a different manner, the, the, the Swiss National Bank, they followed. But apart from some limited purchases of covered bonds, which and not on a macroeconomically relevant scale, the ECB only began to purchase assets outright in some volume during 2014, and then on a large scale, including public sector bonds, including government bonds, in early 2015. So again, the ECB was way behind the other central banks in doing these things. Now, that sounds bad, but it is important to remember that the ECB also took other steps even back in 2008-9, to ease financial market conditions and to remove the blockages which limited the access of banks to loanable funds. So, examples. Instead of deciding on a fixed amount of uh, funds to auction each week, the ECB started to make unlimited funds available in its weekly credit auctions, the so-called fixed rate, full allotment approach. Whatever you bid for, you get at the interest rate posted. And it also prog introduced uh, progressively longer term lending operations that enabled banks to be sure of their funding when making medium term lending commitments. So in mid-2009 there was a one year loan made available, three year loans were made available at the end of 2011, and there was a subsequent four year subsidized loan targeted at banks that expanded uh, business lending. So this chart, I don't expect you to follow every twisted turn in it, but it's showing uh, the range of different instruments that the ECB started to use and the volume of lending associated with it. So it was doing a lot, not on interest rates and not on outright purchases of government bonds, but it was doing a lot in different forms, more liberal forms of, of lending, longer term lending to banks. So it was so these non-standard measures were being adopted less conspicuous than interest rates and quantitative easing. There were also significant reductions in the credit standards required for collateral being presented by banks to the ECB when borrowing funds. So it could be lower floors for credit ratings. And this reduced the, the number of banks that had insufficient collateral to access the ECB's borrowing window. So a bank might come and say, look, we'd like to borrow more money from you, but our collateral, it's okay, but it's not satisfying your normal standards. Well, the ECB lowered those standards and said, we're going to take lower quality collateral because we don't want to be shutting out banks that have reasonable collateral. Indeed, it was even prepared to accept as collateral something called own-use bonds. This was a German invention created by banks uh, if guaranteed by sufficiently creditworthy third parties. The banks created these bonds, put them on their balance sheet, and then used them as collateral. Very strange kind of operation. So the ECB was quite innovative in uh, making it more possible for loanable funds to flow. And these non-standard measures re resulted in very large increase in lending by the ECB. And you can see those surges of very large quantities as banks which had lost confidence in the functioning of interbank markets, wished to hold very large precautionary cash balances. And the increases happened not only in 2008 and 9, 10, you can see the early surge, again towards the end of 2011 and into 2012 as a second wave of banking pressure, this time driven to a large extent by a loss of confidence by US investors in some of the major European banks. Uh, the major European banks had come to depend quite a lot on funds deposited or lent to them by American investors. So they had to be replaced by longer term ECB lending. So there are some quite complicated things happening. ECB is slow on some of the high profile things, but quick on other things. And so what was going on? And why was the ECB's stance on interest rates and quantitative easing so much out of line 
with its liberal, non-standard policies on bank liquidity. So I want to suggest that this is best summarized by an ECB decision to cope with the realization that its wider implicit financial stability mandate required a wider toolkit by adopting something which they called the separation principle. According to this separation principle, the ECB's macroeconomic price stability mandate would continue to be addressed through the use of conventional interest rate policies, the 1990s model. While financial market instability, the crisis, would be addressed only with non-standard measures. So you would not try to adjust the interest rates to fix the crisis. You would adapt the interest rates just to the inflation prospects. Now this separation principle is not an original idea. It goes back to Tinbergen's assignment principle. It was actually in vogue in the 1990s when people started to talk about how central banks might think of dealing with uh, asset price bubbles. Now the separation principle, I want to say a number of things about it. An enthusiast for the separation principle could even defend the first of those 2011 interest rate increases, a little the ziggurat, uh, saying, okay, we know we still have a crisis going on, but I'm worried about inflation. And interest rates don't have to adjust to the crisis, they can adjust to inflation. So you could possibly justify the first. I don't think you could justify the second interest rate increase because one increase would have been enough to indicate the ECB's determination not to allow the crisis to leak into higher inflation. And instead there was a second increase in three months. Well, you know, this, people will talk about this. Uh, I, I would I have to call it a blunder, an interest rate blunder for many years. So let me just say another couple of sentences about it. You know, when you think that the G20 countries decided in mid-2010, in 2010, that fiscal expansion was at an end and fiscal consolidation must follow, and that, was, of course, was endorsed by the Euro Area Fiscal Treaty, the market, with this interest rate decision, the market was left to suppose that both fiscal and monetary policy had shifted to a tightening mode. Fortunately, these increases were reversed before the end of 2011, but not without having done some damage. So why this separation principle? Well, the separation principle, it offered an approach to compromise between those more concerned with financial market disruption and those more concerned with maintaining low inflation. It's not exactly hawks and doves, but if there were divisions, you could fashion a package of measures which said, okay, on inflation, we will just concentrate on the interest rate tool. Let's decide on that and let's deal with other tools for other, other um, problems, the other problem of, of financial market functioning or compromising more generally. Now, this was much more important in the euro area than for any of the other central banks because the euro area, given its multi-country structure, emphasized consensus and a single voice more than other central banks. It was, remember, it, was only, it only started up in 1999. The whole idea of having a single monetary policy for the whole of the euro area for now 19 countries instead of a fragmented monetary policy for each of the countries. This required lots of uh, compromise, lots of people buttoning their mouths when they said, I don't think we're in the right, it doesn't suit me. I work in, I don't know, Slovakia, and I would prefer an interest rate increase. No, you work for the euro area as a whole. And the ECB worked very hard in the early years to emphasize consensus to de-emphasize disagreement, to speak in with a single voice. There was a, an agreement and a decision of the governing council that the ECB speaks with a single voice and the president is the spokesperson on monetary policy. 
and that was very uh, carefully maintained until it started to fragment uh, uh, three or four years ago. So it was important to be able to compromise and to be able to uh, have something for everyone and not force uh, policy into a single direction. The financial market disruption could thus be held at bay with the liberal ECB's lending policies as regards banks without any let up in the fight against inflation and without any specific concessions to the financing of government, which is another dimension uh, that started to become important when you think about quantitative easing. The hawks, who were given free reign with the interest rate, if you like, held a strong, over-strong line on anti-inflationary interest rate policy. The doves succeeded in stabilizing banking. But soon it became clear that separation was not entirely possible. For one thing, the low interest rates were not being transmitted in a fully effective manner throughout the euro area. Indeed, the effective structure of interest rates was becoming perverse. So the ECB's policy rate was at 1%, but the effective cost of funds to banks in surplus countries with close to full employment, such as led by Germany, was about zero. Why? Because the banks in those countries had so much liquidity that no one was prepared to pay significantly more than the ECB's deposit rate, which is 1% below its policy rate, then 0%, whereas banks in the stressed countries, where aggregate economic activity was well below potential, were dependent on borrowing from the ECB at 1% or sometimes even higher. Let me show you a picture of that. Oops, not that one. Yeah. So, um, actually, this is, this is the interest rate on new loans to firms. It's not really about banks. It's about what they lent on to firms in the euro area. And there, there are stressed countries and the other countries which are surplus countries. And you can see how the gap... Interest rates in stressed countries tended to be always higher, even before the crisis, than in the other countries. But the gap is getting bigger and bigger, and it's partly because of the way the ECB is operating its, its policy in line with the separation principle. Furthermore, the easy liquidity conditions did begin to leak into government funding conditions. So... The Hawks did not want anything the ECB did to make it easy for profligate governments to, to uh, borrow money, but these easy liquidity conditions for banks did start to leak into government funding conditions, notably in the winter of 2011-12, when a large part of those low-cost funds borrowed in the three... Remember I told you about a three-year refinancing operation? A large part of them were reinvested, were invested by banks in some of the stressed countries, some of them not far from here, in higher yielding bonds of their own governments. When the governments of the stressed economies began to lose market access, and this is a chart that you, many, many have seen before. Um, well, it's, it's a different version of it. It's for aficionados, but it shows you the same idea, that for many years the in interest rates paid by governments were the same in Europe, but in the crisis, they started to spread apart uh, and, and become uh, very different as between stressed and unstressed countries. And when the governments of the stressed countries began to lose market access, this inversion of the geographic pattern of interest rates be risked becoming more severe. The high interest rates are in exactly the countries that, from a macroeconomic point of view, need lower interest rates. The ECB's response to this situation in May 2010 seems uncharacteristically vigorous as it embarked on outright purchases of the bonds of the stressed governments. People have forgotten about this program called the Securities Market Program, SMP, May 2010. ECB did actually do some. It's like QE because it's purchasing government bonds. But it's not like QE in that it is not actually increasing the volume of liquidity in the system. And that's what, what uh, allowed them, ECB, to think of doing this. 
as these purchases were offset by sales of other assets, it was fully in line with the separation principle. The SMP was not inflation targeted as such, but although the purchases were in the secondary market and at market price, and although they were far from being sufficient in volume to cap market, bond market spreads at reasonable levels, this SMP was a step too far for those members of the Governing Council that adhered to the most uncompromising positions on monetary financing. And there were two consequential resignations from the Governing Council. Well, the next section of my talk is called Separation Abandoned. There were several other key membership changes in the Governing Council the executive board of the, of the ECB towards the end of 2011, which likely accelerated the demise of the separation principle and allowed a more coherent and integrated approach to ECB policy. No longer for this new team would unconventional policy be limited to dealing with financial market disruption. This was clearly needed as each subsequent year brought severe challenges. I already mentioned the banking stresses of, of 2011. Let me show you some of those. Oh, that's a slide about those. Um, the slides go faster than my talk now. But there's, uh, uh, and, and then in 2012, you had stresses in the intergovernmental stresses on the euro system in 2012, threatening to pull it apart. And this is a, a, a dramatic uh, uh, illustration of the degree to which there were differences between uh, government sovereign spreads in 2012. In 2013, there was more trouble. The beginnings of normalization of US monetary policy. They'd been working without being hampered by a separation principle. They'd been working very fast and they had stabilized their economy much faster than the euro area. So they were starting to normalize and so that was putting upward pressure on interest rates all over the world. It threatened to transmit higher long-term interest rates to Europe. Heading into 2014, a renewed weakening of euro area economic activity. Looked like there might be a, a triple dip in economic activity on the cards. And that clearly called for further monetary easing, even though short-term interest rates were already near the floor. And so by now, the ECB was prepared to use its toolkit more comprehensively and convinced, and it convinced markets of this. The open-ended na nature of the so-called OMT program, that's the one that Mario Draghi announced with his famous speech in London, the introduction during 2013 of forward guidance, instead of saying, I'm, we're just going to keep inflation below, they start telling you, well, here's what we're going to do a bit on interest rates, if you want to know, forecasting uh, interest rate movements. Further lowering of interest rates to zero and below during 2013, 2016. You've seen that chart already. And the expansion of asset purchases, eventually including public sector bonds during, during 2015, was at last thoroughgoing the low inflation, actual and expected, that had begun to grip uh, euro area by 2013 made this transition more easy by aligning the policy goal of hawks and doves. So even the hawks, after a period of many months of low inflation and low inflation prospects, started to think, well, actually, we do actually need lower interest rates if we're to be consistent with our overall view that inflation is the main goal. There could be no doubt that inflation was below target and that virtually all other possible measures short of public sector bond purchases had been tried. Buying in the largest bond market, that for government bonds, was an obvious measure, sanctioned by historical and current usage abroad, and which was clearly permitted by even the most strict reading of the treaty. In effect, by early 2015, it had been demonstrated that there was no alternative to buying government bonds. Well, I hope I've explained why the ECB was so slow in acting, but why has inflation been converging so slowly? 
In early 2016, the ECB doubled down on these policies, increasing the rate of purchase and adding non-bank corporate bonds to the program, lowering short-term interest rates even further. Now the banks are paying 40 basis points for the privilege of placing deposits at the ECB. But despite these measures, inflation is still bumping around above zero, but well below the 2% benchmark. Well, I'm confident that inflation rate will converge towards its 2%, but how can the slow impact be explained? To some extent, the slow convergence of inflation, oh, there are the interest rates falling down. You can see the euro area, quite, quite a negative territory there. Well, I don't have time to move on. It, uh, the slow convergence of inflation can be attributed to a global phenomenon, namely the so-called flattening of the Phillips curve, by which I mean the tightening of the labor market, falling unemployment rates, seems to be having a much smaller impact on wage inflation than was previously the case. And this observation we see applying to many other countries beyond the Euro area, and it may have something to do with increased indirect competition from the Far East and China and other emerging economies, lowering the market power of labor in any given country. But more relevant to our topic here, to an extent, the explanation lies in the fact that the measures we have described, which we think are huge, two and a quarter billion of purchases of government bonds, they're quantitatively unprecedented, but they're in fact, in a sense, less than they seem to be. And this applies both to the interest rate measures and to the asset purchase measures. So, so although nominal interest rates are at their lowest possible levels, and we've seen the minus signs there, real short-term interest rates are far from being exceptionally low. And actually, that's why you definitely need asset purchases in this environment. By buying long-term assets, the central bank has been doing whatever it can do to change interest, lower interest rates. It can't lower nominal interest rates any further, minus 40 basis points, but it can flatten the yield curve and make longer term interest rates lower by buying the long term assets. There's been a global trend towards the reduction in the equilibrium real long term interest rate anyway, even if central banks weren't being active. So central banks have not pushed market rates as far below the current equilibrium rate as would have been achieved in previous episodes of recession or below target inflation. You know, naive criticism of these asset purchase programs speak of money printing and that uh, inflation is going to be inevitable down the road. And such commentary neglects the fact that what the ECB is doing is, for example, exchanging a cash deposit at the ECB for a German government bond. You've got a German government bond, give me the German government bond and I'll give you some cash. It's not as, it's very different from the central bank just handing out newly created cash to the government for it to spend. The exchange of two safe and marketable instruments differing mainly in their term to maturity, it shifts the yield curve but it doesn't in itself represent an injection of spending power. So it's less than it often seems. Now admittedly, by buying the bonds of governments for which there are some, there is some perceived credit risk, the ECB does reduce credit risk premium. But again, it's an exchange of assets. It's not a gift. These policies have changed the aggregate side of both sides of the balance sheet of the Euro system central banks, but has, they've had little impact on the net capital of the central banks. So the policies have had a worthwhile effect, 1.5% higher on GDP, 50 basis points on inflation by 2018, that's the ECB's estimates, but not the dramatic and dangerous shock feared by critics. So my final point, my final puzzle and my uh, question that I've promised to answer, what about helicopter money? Could the ECB do more? If, if QE asset purchases work mainly through the cost of finance and by affecting credit and term premium, would it have been possible for the ECB to make a quicker impact on aggregate economic activity and inflation by some more direct means such as helicopter money that we've often heard so much about? <laughs>
Well, I want to make two points about helicopter money. First of all, I want to make the point that yes, it could work, and I'm, in this I'm contradicting some distinguished um, uh, academic authorities. But I'm also going to make the point that it may be politically just a step too far in Europe. Scholars have debated the possible effectiveness of helicopter money, and several of them have argued that it cannot really have much of an effect. And I think that view is mistaken. Because, and it's, that view comes from appealing to the properties of a sort of long-term equilibrium. You look at a long-term equilibrium without helicopter money and a long-term equilibrium with helicopter money and you say, look, I've proved there cannot be any, any difference. It's a kind of, well, it's a Ricardian equivalence type of argument. It assumes that expectations and spending behavior are fully adapted to any shock that has occurred. But the call for helicopter money is not made at times when we're in a full equilibrium. It's made when the economy is far from equilibrium and when many economic agents are constrained, liquidity constrained, not, by their, not constrained by their lifetime resources, but by liquidity constraints. So it could include governments as well as lower income households. Models that predict little impact for helicopter money do not take account of such liquidity constraints. So as, as Milton Friedman supposed, Economic agents picking up dollar bills or euro bills dropped from a helicopter will sh surely go and spend most of them, thereby increasing aggregate demand and driving up the price level in the, with an impact effect, as well as generating more economic activity. To the extent that helicopter money breaks a liquidity constraint for the recipients, it might therefore unleash a substantially different impact effect than these models assume. But when it comes to considering how such a policy might be implemented in practice, it becomes evident that this is an area where the euro area suffers from a shortage of mandate. The distribution, oh, sorry, I was going to show you. Well, I'm not going to show you those because I've moved on. These are inflation charts to show you how it's not converging as quickly as one hoped. That's the helicopter money. The distribution of newly created cash without any quid pro quo raises a question that's not inherent in quantitative easing asset purchases. To whom will the cash be distributed? If you're doing QE, if you're buying government bonds, you say, I'm buying government bonds. Who, who will offer me the cheapest price? And then the problem of who you're dealing with is solved. You say, I'm going to give out some money. Well, this person is closest to me here. But that's not a good method. Let me think of another method. Equally to everyone in the euro area? Well, when you put it like that, we see immediately we're in the area of fiscal policy. You're talking about allocating grant money. International fiscal policy at that. Can the ECB, could the ECB take it on itself to make some kind of lump sum distribution across the 19 countries with their wide differences in income levels within and between countries? I did a little calculation. Uh, supposing the ECB did helicopter money on the same scale as it made the asset purchases. Well, that would give everybody in Lithuania, uh, on a, and equally distributed to everybody in the euro area, people in Lithuania would, would get a 25% bonus every month to their average income. Well, sorry, the, the average income of Lithuania, not every person's income this figure for Luxembourg would be 4%. Now, that might be a great idea, but is it an idea that a central bank can adjudicate on? Are we not definitely going to the point where somebody is going to blow the whistle and shout stop and say, we gave you independence to maintain inflation stability. We didn't give you independence to hand out goodies to different countries in amounts that are uh, of different significance. And of course you could divide, divide it, not, not the same amount to everybody, you could choose another scheme. So central banks could dream up loads of ways of distributing helicopter money. Of course quantitative easing has distributional effects, more complex than they appear at first sight. But asset purchases have long been accepted as a normal activity of a central bank. And thus central banks have an implicit, if not explicit, problem power to carry them out. I think that the central banking history and lore, which we appealed at the beginning to um, 
that central banks use to justify aggressive policies countering financial instability, they can hardly be said to include the endorsement of such quasi-fiscal action as a helicopter money would, in, would involve. So the ECB would certainly be seen as exceeding its mandate by many people and entering into activities lacking democratic legitimacy, and a legal challenge would, I expect, be successful. But much the same effect could be achieved by the creation of an understanding between governments and the ECB that the latter, that the ECB, would maintain financial market conditions through continued intervention in government bond markets to enable governments to make a needed coordinated expansion of spending to achieve the desired expansion of aggregate demand in the euro area without this spilling over onto their cost of borrowing. This would have been a type of, of helicopter money which was not used. Of course, such coordination would need extremely careful governance to ensure continued central bank independence and to prevent the risk of fiscal dominance. What would be needed is independent measures adopted by fiscal and monetary authorities, each taking account of what the other is doing. This brings us back to the macroeconomic policy failures of 2010 and 11. I refer to the reluctance of those euro area governments that had sufficient fiscal headroom to keep spending and the ECB's failure to recognize during 2011 the emerging deficiency of aggregate demand. At its heart, the call for helicopter money is essentially a call for more expansionary fiscal policy, which would clearly have been appropriate in 2010 and 2011. The independent central bank's role would be to ensure that it does not act in such a way that financial markets respond to the needed fiscal expansion by choking it off. Achieving this within the legal and political structures of the euro area would be delicate and challenging, and perhaps not impossible if it proved necessary as it does not at the present moment to bring inflation back on target. So I think the, the, the moment has passed, but the moment could come again. So my final remarks. The crisis has gradually drawn the ECB into policy areas and instruments for which its mandate is less explicit, though no less real. Like other major central banks, it has had to innovate in response to developments in globalization, in commodity price fluctuations, and in unusually large fiscal deviations. In doing so, it has been criticized for working at, ah, yes, I meant to, I meant to show this graph earlier on, showing the di discrepancy, can I just pause for a moment to, to, to the, these are the, um, the uh, this is the scale of international borrowing and lending through the European Central Bank, and the colors represent different countries. And the interesting point about it is it shows you the surge of, of the, uh, activity of the ECB in 2011 that you talked about and the subsequent surge related to QE. But the interesting thing and the thing that causes the political pressures, which are not just hidden potential political pressures but real live political pressures, is the identity of the countries and the fact that if you're on the top of the curve, a lender, you stay on the top, on the top of the curve all the way through. And if you're a borrower, like that red country there, which is Spain, or the blue country, which is Italy, you stay on the borrowing side right through the crisis. And these, uh, these translate into the sorts of political pressure I've been hinting to and alluding to. The ECB's expanded bank supervision role with the multi-country single supervisory mechanism has involved similar issues, which I've not had time to expand on today. Having tested the limits of their mandates, the ECB and other European Central Banks are unlikely to want to return to the light touch policy of the 1990s. But this wider toolbox that Central Banks are using to address a wider set of policy goals than mere price stability calls for careful communication, especially as achievement of these goals is not easy to verify. With accountability necessarily weakened, Retaining the independence with which central banks have been endowed will require a continuously successful program of public communication explaining just what central banks are doing and why. So those are the remarks. I'm afraid I've gone on longer than I intend to they on. So let me start by thanking uh, Professor Onohan for this very, very interesting talk.
uh, with a very much of an insider view on a lot of problems through the crisis that I think is very, very interesting for a lot of public, for students and also for us, with a provocative view of the helicopter money when he said in a model which is with agents are liquidity constrained, and also uh, with a sort of a new view, version of the relationship between uh, fiscal and monetary policy in a view, in a view uh, different view, if you want, of the uh, relationship between fiscal and monetary policy in different countries which are heterogeneous. So I've been asked to coordinate the round table uh, and uh, so I think if there are questions from the audience, we can start and uh, we will get two or three questions at a time and ask Professor Ononan to answer to those and then start again, so please. If you can introduce yourself. Um, hi, uh, I'm Agnieszka Smolenska. I'm a researcher in the law department. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And as you can uh, maybe expect as a lawyer, um, when, you, when we are discussing financial stability as an implicit power of the ECB, there are numerous uh, concerns which arise. And um, I wanted to ask more uh, if you could explain about the relationship between financial stability as an implicit power and the separation principle, because somehow the way financial stability has been read into uh, competence of the ECB has always been through uh, the linkage with price stability. And this is also the argument that Pada Askiopa was making of uh, financial stability as the land in between. So I just wanted to understand a little bit how the two fit together, especially since financial stability is also an objective which is pursued not only by the ECB, but also by numerous other uh, actors, supervisors, regulators, etc. And the second question may be something a little bit more uh, uh, looking into the future. Uh, I was wondering what you thought about the involvement of central banks in cryptocurrencies and digital, which is something that seems to be new and appearing. Thank you. I'd like to feel more. Okay, Gian Piero Gallo, uh, Italian Court of Auditors and the former Professor of Econometrics at the University of Florence. Uh, I'm teaching money banking at the local NYU uh, program and we're talking about uh, dual mandates, uh, mandate uh, in central banks. And it seems to me that, uh, uh, I mean, you dealt with the problem, but uh, next to price stability and financial stability, uh, employment uh, growth uh, something should be finally recognized as uh, one uh, of the uh, targets that we need to, to pursue. I mean, from political point of view, our countries are deeply divided. There is a strong anti-euro sentiment that reverberates uh, throughout uh, uh, Europe. Uh, the response uh, of uh, having price stability doesn't seem to be something that uh, politically people really care about. They care about uh, the figures of uh, employment, the fig the, they, they care about uh, credit reaching the, uh, where it's needed, so outside the banks uh, into the real, the real economy. So do you think that it's time to, uh, I mean the time is mature for putting the emphasis on uh, a correction in the mandate uh, of uh, the European Central Bank. I mean, helicopter money ultimately addresses uh, that issue. So how do we reach, uh, how can we reach uh, uh, people, so workers and, uh, and companies, uh, when, they need, uh, when they need money to compensate for the deep austerity that was the response for the crisis and perhaps it was not at uh, the political level the best uh, uh, response that uh, we could give. I think you have enough with these two, three questions to start with. <laughs> yes. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start at the, at the back and come to, to yours. Um, you know, I, I, I have no problem with the Federal Reserve's dual mandate, actually triple mandate because they have a, a, a as, you, as you well know, uh, have a third mandate about uh, keeping interest rates low, which they brush under the carpet and try to ignore. Um, 
in this period that we're looking at here, which is now 10, 10 years long, um, it, it hasn't been the case, except possibly briefly in the spring of 2011, and personally, as I indicated, I think this was a blunder to interpret it in that way, it hasn't been the case that the unemployment, an unemployment mandate, if it was raised in the, in the profile of the ECB, would have led the ECB to push in a different direction. So if you have the, in the price stability mandate and unemployment and you've got to balance them, uh, well, mo most of the time, I would say all of the time since 20, 2007, they are both saying expansion. Expansion because your inflation is too low and expansion because your unemployment is too high. So they're both pulling, pushing in the same direction. And I don't think that uh, in practice, in this period, it would have made that much of a difference to have the additional unemployment mandate in it. So I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not sure that we could have uh, guaranteed a better performance of, of policy if the mandate had been there. I think what we could say, and I think it would be standard in, in what had become conventional macroeconomic policy in the, in the 1990s is that the fiscal policy was not, uh, did not stay expansionary for long enough in 2010 and 2011. And of course, there were a number of other mistakes that were made around, uh, around the stressed countries. Uh, but if we're simply talking about uh, anti-inflation policy and uh, macroeconomic unemployment stabilization policy, definitely there, was, there were failings in fiscal policy uh, that, that and, and the, the ECB's expansionary monetary policy could only go some distance to make up. Uh, so, uh, and, and I, what I've tried to emphasize as well is that although, and, although unemployment isn't there explicitly, it is there definitely in the second phrase which says supporting the economic policies of, of the union, but it's there in a subordinate role. Um, now, on the question of, um, the legal question of the legal justification for the various non-standard measures. Uh, you're right in, in saying that uh, each of these measures has been justified in terms of, uh, the, of the inflation goal, but it's in terms of what you might think of as the plumbing needed to keep the inflation policy going. So uh, the words, I'm, I'm hopeless at remembering legal formulae that are used, but the words that were used constantly were things like uh, to, uh, to correct the disruption in the monetary transmission mechanism. And if we don't have a monetary transmission mechanism, we cannot transmit our monetary policy to the inflation target. So uh, we're doing stuff to unblock the pipes that go from monetary policy to inflation. And that's what we're doing in the non-standard measures, and therefore they're fully justified for the, the in inflation goal. Um, and, but how much do we do? Uh, do we use interest rates to... Uh, to resolve the financial crisis. No, they, we're using other, we get the plumber in to fix the transmission mechanism and we have all these non-standard measures. But we still then have a monetary policy meeting on inflation and we don't, we don't look at the plumbing. We say, is the plumbing all right? Hope the plum, is the plumber still working there? Hope they'll improve that. Now, where's inflation going? Should we have a higher interest rate? No. Should we have a lower interest rate? Maybe yes. So th I think that's, that's a resolution of this, this legal um, but as you suggest, this, is, this has been challenged, and of course, around the OMT program, it was actually challenged very vigorously in the German Constitutional Court, and that challenge was supported by the Bundesbank, which was the, the biggest undermining of the old tradition of the ECB that the, of, of trying to build everything around consensus. Uh, but in the end, the various uh, legal authorities decided no, yes, they have to fix the plumbing, and um, they're doing a reasonable job. Now, cryptocurrencies takes us well away um, from what I was talking about, but still within the general area of what are the mandates of, of central banks. Uh, not an expert on, it's definitely in the area of plumbing, but, but uh, I'm not an expert on, on cryptocurrencies. But where I have sort of settled my mind on it is, first of all, I'm a great enthusiast for technology. I can believe that the blockchain technology has a lot 
um, to be said for it and may, may represent a, a big breakthrough. Not quite sure how big of a breakthrough because uh, I'm not entirely convinced that it doesn't create huge amounts of usage of computer storage and com computer processing power to achieve its goals of the payment system. We know Bitcoin, everybody knows about Bitcoin, but the amount of electricity Bitcoin is actually using for its particular version of cryptocurrencies is very large, even though they're doing hardly any payments relative to the sort of payment system that uh, we have in the normal banking world. So I think it might be a little bit down the road before we uh, see uh, this being viable in terms of actually usage of electricity and the usage of computing power. I could be wrong on that. That's a, that's a technical point. But I, I think there, it, it, it is likely that there will be more use of this and that central banks may actually end up, not today or tomorrow, but maybe in 10 or 20 years, uh, becoming dominant players in the payment system. They're already in the paper payment system. They're the main players. They produce the, 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 uh, the notes and coin or the notes anyway, that they could become dominant players in the way that banks are the dominant players in the payment system. And that might be a very good development. Why? Because one of the reasons we have been so keen to protect the functioning of the banking system is not so much to look after the large depositors and not so much to look after the availability of credit. Those are important. The vital function of the banking system is keeping payments going and ensuring that if you want to buy something from somebody that you can exchange uh, the, the ownership through a payments mechanism that functions. Now, if the central banks found that they could do this with the blockchain technology, then that function of banking would wither and banks would simply be doing other things and they could be left, they, they wouldn't have the same sort of um, uh, ability to hold the rest of the world to ransom. Next. More question? Yep. Uh, my concern is about the fact that uh, countries like as, as Italy are paying uh, an extra uh, interest cost due to their uh, riskiness uh, because the, the, the debt is, is, is huge. Uh, which should be the compensation, uh, and, and the risk should be there just for compensate for default. But the situation is such that default is avoided in all ways on the part not only of, of Italy itself, but on the part of the um, European institution. And uh, situation for Greece, apart from the initial default, probably similar for other countries. So it's. Um, uh, awkward that uh, a country continues for so long to pay such an extra uh, cost of indebtedness. Uh, of course, if there were um, an independent uh, central bank for the currency of, of that country, that wouldn't happen. So I wonder if among the various proposals that have, that have been about what the central bank or the European financial system could do for uh, solving this uh, situation that I know my country it's hard to imagine that uh, a government will be so strong as to reduce the size of the government debt soon. So probably the situation is going to continue a long time. And I mentioned in situation, um, ideas such as uh, um, indebtedness on the part of the European Union as such, uh, somehow with the involvement of the, of the central bank. Okay. Uh, I have a second question, if I can. If, uh, if, if the institution, European institutions are really better prepared to face the next crisis, the next crisis after all the plumbing eh, and all the creation of new, new tools uh, that have been uh, realized during the current crisis. We, if you want to, have, there is another question from Bridget. If uh, yeah, well, we'll do 
importance of uh, democratic legitimacy and you say that more active communication. And I have two questions. One, communication with whom? Is it predominantly publics, governments, parliaments, or, or, and or markets, or all of, the, all of them? And then the nature of the communication. Is it a communication that's justificatory, that says, this is what we are doing and this is why we're doing it. Is, it. is that the kind of communication that's required? So the question on, uh, on debt levels and so forth is, first of all, let me say one of the great side effects of QE, and it's certainly not an objective of QE, but it's a big side effect, is to have lowered, dramatically lowered the spreads on uh, the, the uh, more heavily indebted countries, Italy, Portugal now, Spain, um, and Portugal was, was not benefiting when people felt it might fall out of eligibility from the, from the, for QE because to, to be bought in QE you needed to have a, a rating that was sufficiently high and, and only one agency. And now it's two agencies, now it's safe and so its, it's uh, spread has come down. So you can see quite visibly this is a QE effect. And, and actually it, 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 it's Italy. Italian sovereign can borrow at, at well under 2% for 10 years, which is you know, much less than it used to be when it had an independent central bank, by the way. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, uh, so um, I think that we do have to consider that the ECB is a, a collective, it's a, a, a system for the whole of Europe. And I remember, um, I I know that, that uh, senior officials in the countries that have traditionally been saving countries, traditionally been surplus countries, they have uh, promised in the development of the euro area, this will not be taking your savings and throwing it away on profligate governments. They, and, and this is a, a deep promise that, that officials and politicians have made to their people. And it may seem irrelevant now, but it's not irrelevant to them, and, and they will fight against the use of this system uh, to, to, uh, to subsidize uh, uh, governments in a way that, that is, is ultimately damaging. The question, of course, is, is it subsidizing, and is it ultimately damaging? And there are many people, I don't fully share the view, who, who, uh, who think that um, it, that if the ECB had started buying right away government paper and bought in such quantities as to keep the spreads so that that curve that I should never opened out again, that we wouldn't have seen the problems that we had. But I know many other people who say we would have seen worse problems because the debtor countries would have borrowed even more and eventually it would have been an even bigger mess. This is a very hard question. We will not find an answer to it this afternoon. but. It, it is not, just because the ECB has a lot of freedom of action now doesn't mean it should use it in such a way as to lose that freedom of action in a well-justified uh, complaints from countries who are told that their money would not be wasted. So it is a problem. You mean it's a reasonable compromise? What you say? I think we're seeing a very reasonable compromise uh, now. Um, now you, your your second point was in one word. Well, the next slide. Ne next slide. Okay. okay. Uh, and my answer to that is, um, I, I'm of course we've learned lessons, and there are things that we won't do again, and the next crisis will be different. Um, but from a governance point of view, has the governance of the European monetary policy, macroeconomic policy, fiscal policy, uh, it has improved. There are new institutions. The SSM is there, that's a very good institution. The European Resolution Board, uh, we can talk about that for a long time. These are all very powerful uh, improvements in institutional structure of the ECB. But I'm very worried about the fact that the decisions, the key decisions, are taken in such a, a, an unsatisfactory form as late night meetings of uh, finance ministers in the Eurogroup the ECOFIN and in, in the summits. This is no way to conduct policy. It's the only way we had available, but it's not a good way. And, and I don't know whether we can build, and, our, and we certainly haven't really built structures that we can rely on uh, 
but we've, we've learned a few lessons and we're, it'll be more streamlined. Communication, um, Richard, what kind of communication? Um, of course there's the communication of the Parliament. It's, it's already there. But, um, and that's very important because that gives you a forum for a question and answer environment, which is not there, readily there when you're speaking to the general public because the general public can't answer back. You're on television and you say, blah, 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 and the interviewer says something that she thinks the general public wants to know, but might not be what the general public wants to know. But there's the to and fro with the politicians, which is not always constructive because sometimes uh, politicians have to be re-elected and therefore they have to um, you perform a little bit. And we all know that, and, and, and I, I respect that. But it, it, it can weaken the quality of, of the debate. I think it's, it, ultimately it is the, 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 the general public, the informed public that need to understand so that if there are uh, wild ideas, the general public say, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that because actually we think the central banks are using the tools as well as they can and doing what is necessary to achieve goals which we share. Um, and, and so I think that's important. Then the, com the communication with governments um, is also, but it's different. The communication with governments is, is not particularly in public. I mean, obviously there's transparency, but it's not particularly in public, but it's, it's a more a functional communication. It's um, what, what exactly are you doing? What are the, your, why don't you do this? Because if you do, did this, we could do that. That's the sort of communication which some people in the early years of the ECB felt was inappropriate for central banks because we're independent. And um, I think that's an official from the Treasury Ministry. I better walk to the other side of the street. And I think that's not practical in a crisis or in, in facing the, the situations that we have been facing in recent years. So it's all of these dimensions, but in different ways. My name is Domenica Tropeano. I come from the University of Macerata, Italy. Uh, so my question is about uh, the long-term financing, uh, refinancing operation by the ECB. You stressed in your talk that uh, this was uh, an unconventional tool, quite different from other policies that were carried out by other central banks. And this unconventional operation have lasted until now, although the form of the uh, refinancing has changed with the target uh, long-term refinancing operation and so on, but the, uh, the maturity of the loans has increased even uh, until uh, four years. Um, so um, this, according to some scholars, reflects the fact that uh, the, inter the unsecured interbank market is, is not, was not working well starting from the, uh, 2012. Uh, but you, do you think that since this policy has not been uh, interrupted, although conditions have improved, do you think uh, this will be, uh, this will go on in the future? This long-term refinancing operation for so long uh, maturities. Uh, my impression would be that probably this was a, a policy for a certain moment. It had two dimensions to it. One was assurance of financing. ECB realize it's no good for banks to know that we can borrow this week and next week and maybe the week after that. They need to get the, the funds if they want to commit to a lending relationship which is longer. I think that the normalization of uh, financial markets has probably reached the point where it's not really necessary to, uh, to provide that assurance anymore that banks, mostly banks, have have got to the point where they know how much they can borrow from the markets and that they have reasonable assurance for it. Maybe I'm a little bit ahead of myself now and you have to remember that, that it's two years since I was there at the coalface and so I'm not completely in touch with market movements. The other dimension to the, the, the targeted LTRO operations was this <coughs> element of discrimination or subsidy towards banks that were actually lending. And this, uh, schemes of that type were introduced in the Bank of England as well and in a different way by, by the Fed. Um, uh, I, I think those will go by the wayside. I, they were, I think... Targeted. Yeah, I, I 
I certainly wouldn't be designing schemes of that type um, because once you start in that, it's okay in a crisis you can do anything because it, things need to be shaken up. But in normal times, if you, uh, I don't think many people would want to go back to the situation where we're saying, now, let me see, telecommunications, should the rate should be a little bit higher. Uh, now, as far as um, taxi, shared taxi services, a little bit lower, no, you don't want to have a tiered structure. Of, and, and that's where that kind of uh, targeted scheme with, with differential rates drags the central bank into a very detailed specification of who gets money for what. And, and then people's focus deviates from building lending relationships with plausible customers to finding ways of extracting subsidies from the central bank. It's, it's not the most constructive long-term relation for a central bank. Yes, but um, uh, if I can I reply? Yes. Um, so the market abnormal. You, you say there is no need to continue with this long-term refinancing operation because the market, financial market, have normalized. But uh, so far I know, or I've seen in the literature, um, the inter the unsecured interbank market has not normalized until uh, up to now. So the banks have replaced the, the unsecured interbank market either with direct long-term central bank refinancing or with the secured market. So if the, uh, uh, those long-term refinancing operations do not go on, do not continue, then uh, implicitly the, um, the central bank approves this uh, substitution between the unsecured market and the secured one. I, I, think I guess, I, I think don't know. I think that's the reality. I, I think uh -huh. that, that uh, pro probably we will not see an, an the open, unsecured market uh, in the way that we saw it in the yes, past, but that there will be a sufficient turn to reality. And it may not be now, but it may need to be phased, but I think we're, that's where we're heading. Oh, well, that's what my question. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> are there other questions? I, I don't see many hands raised, but I do have a couple of uh, questions myself. I know you have left two years ago, so you're not involved directly. However, a big debate now is about whether to end the quantitative easing with a fixed date or not, and also whether to have it at the, to prolong it, but to have it at a slower pace. Uh, do you have any view on that? And that's the first question. The second is, as an Irish, um, person living now and being in touch with the economy, you had this long, we had this long period of interest rate which were very low interest rate. Do you think that this has had an impact on the Irish economy in the sense that, for instance, a lot of firms that maybe were not so productive could actually stay on the market because that um, low interest rate. So what is the impact, in other words, of this quantitative easing on the real side of the economy as a transmission to, through the firm's productivity? So um, <coughs> I don't have a very uh, definite view on whether they, they made a decision now to reduce the, the rate at which they buy um, government paper. Partly this reflects a limited amount of, of paper of the types that they have considered eligible. Uh, ECB decided it would not buy more than a certain percentage of each government's uh, debt uh, for, for various reasons, including uh, one, uh, they wanted a market to still exist. They don't want to buy all the debt and then there's no, no, no private market for it. But another reason is that um, supposing the and it, it obviously happened with the case of the Greek debt. There was a restructuring of, of debt, like there was in the Greek debt. Um, if the ECB had held more than a certain fraction, and it varies for the different bond issues, if the ECB had held a certain fraction of the Greek debt, it would have had to vote for the restructuring uh, if the restructuring was to go ahead. But lawyers, and they differ, uh, but many lawyers said, no, wait a minute, you can't vote for the restructuring of a government debt because that is an amounts to giving a gift to the government and writing off part of your debt. So lawyers are concerned that the ECB might end up holding too much, uh, so much of government debt that they would 
be a de facto blocker of a restructuring. Not that they're expecting a restructuring, but just conceptually you wouldn't want to get that. So that provides a sort of ceiling about how much you want to buy. So that's one of the reasons that you need to, to underrate it. But look, they are focused on in inflation, right? That is the, the goal, and the economy is recovering. So there are, there's every reason to be confident that over the next year or so, the fact that they're not buying anymore after maybe, I don't know, sometime at the end of, towards the end of next year, if they're not buying any more government debt, they're still holding a huge amount of, of government debt. They're not selling, they're not, as the, the, these debts mature, they will roll them and buy some more. And they're still holding interest rates extremely low. It's still a very expansionary policy. I think that we could expect that the ECB will be, it will continue to provide a positive impetus to, uh, to the recovery. Now, the, your question about, um, about uh, whether low interest rates enable people to survive uh, for longer when they should be closed down, um, I, uh, <laughs> I actually think that this, the low interest rates probably have slowed the banks dealing with de distressed borrowers. Uh, in the Irish case, the borrowers were primarily um, residential mortgages. And so although you hear a lot about the Italian uh, more non-performing loans, very high, and, and other countries, but Ireland is also high and not, not falling as much as we would have expected and hoped because the banks are saying, well, sure, we'll just leave it for another year. Um, interest rates, zero. Uh, what are we losing if we let it run and maybe the house prices will go up and we'll be able to recover the collateral at a higher value. So I think that has definitely slowed the, their, uh, their engagement and their willingness to cut deals with, with, with borrowers. Um, and I'm sure that's the case also in other countries. Uh, are there other questions from the public? Well, if not, let us thank for this interesting lecture and join in the applause. There is, there is a cocktail drink, a drink, there are drinks outside for everyone. <laughs>